going to share my screen. So let me bring up the presentation. So tonight we're going to talk about strings and lists. Um, and they kind of go hand in hand because a string is just an ordered collection of characters. It's an ordered list of characters that you can't do as much with as you can a list, but we'll talk about that. So what is a string? It's an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. That's all it is. It's also immutable, which means you cannot change a string. Now that doesn't always make a lot of sense because you have to change strings. String manipulation basically means you have to change strings. The way we work with that is that Python provides a bunch of um, functions to modify strings. We only begin to scratch the surface in this class on what we can do to modify strings. So let's say what we see in our script is I have a variable called myster. What that line is, it's a line of Python. I have a variable called myster. Myster is a variable, and I know it is because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is an open quote, the words, this is a string, and close quote. So myster, the variable myster, holds the value, this is a string. And what Python sees is it sees the name myster and then a value space. And when we're thinking about Python, we can think about it like this, because this is kind of what it looks like in the computer memory. Um, you'll notice in the value, there are no quotes. And that's an important thing to remember. The quotes are not part of the string. The quotes are nomenclature or syntax for Python to say, OK, you're starting a string here, and you're ending a string here. That's all the quotes are for. They are not actually part of the string. What's part of the string is what's in between those quotes. OK, so for every open quote, you have to have a closing quote of the same type. And sometimes this gets to people because they'll put an open double quote, and then they'll forgotten to put like a closing single quote. and the quotes then aren't balanced. You don't have the same number of ones opening as you do closing. And when that happens, Python's going to give you a syntax error. OK, so what's not a string? And these are just some pretty, you know, again, I have an opening quote without a closing quote. I have an opening double quote and a closing single quote, so Python's going to say that's not a string. And then I have an opening quote and another, and then a, a quote, and then another quote. So I got three of the same kind of quotes in a row. And Python's going to say, my stir is, this is a space quote. And that's what it's going to try and count as the string. And then when it sees string quote right afterwards, it's going to give you a syntax error. So I just the same rule. I'm going to repeat myself a little bit for every opening quote. You have to have a closing quote of the same type. All right, so this is really quick. How do we correct those errors? Well, we add a closing quote of the correct type. I have an opening double quote on the second one, and I get rid of the close single quote, and I sorry close yeah close single quote, and I put a close double quote. And for my stir, this is a string. I have an opening and closing quote, but then I got that weird quote in the middle. So there's two different things you can do. One of the things you can do is you can escape the quote. Escaping, putting that backslash in front of the quote, tells Python that this quote is actually a character in the string. Or you could surround that string with single quotes. Either works. OK. 
we're going to look at what ordered means. So, an ordered collection of characters. So what we're seeing is this is a string. What Python really has is it has a list. And that list inherently has a number for every single letter. And a letter isn't necessarily something we can see. Sorry, a character. Every single character. A character isn't necessarily something we can see. Characters can be spaces. They can be tabs. They can be new lines. There can be beeps. So what I'm looking at is a, an index. That's what I call it. An index that is associated with every single letter. The index for all lists in Python, the first index number is always zero. Don't know why it's that way. It is. So you always have to remember that. And as we get into lists, we're going to reinforce that. So in my case, in the case of this is a string, there are 16 characters. Those characters start with index zero which is associated with a capital T, and through index number 15, which is associated with a lowercase g, and all the indexes in between. This is what keeps the order. That's the index number. And the way we can read this is T is at index 0, H is at index 1, I is at index 2, and so forth. And that's how you would read. You could say G is at index 15. Um, every character has a numerical placeholder, and I call it an index. Um, a list, now, we're about to take a foray into lists, and we're doing that because we need to understand lists better for two reasons. First of all, a string is a list. Second of all, they're going to introduce some things about splitting and slicing and joining, and the, sorry, splitting. And those will create lists from strings. So we have to take a foray into lists to understand a little bit better what a list is separate from a string. So a string is a specific kind of list. And then there are generic lists. Now in module four, no, module six, we're going to do a deep dive into lists and dictionaries. For right now, this is our, our look at lists. And we will use these lists not just in Module 2, but in Module 3 and in Module 4 before we do the deep dive. So, um, so it's important to understand what a list is because you're going to actually use this stuff for the next two modules until we actually do our deep, three modules until we actually do our deep, deep dive into collections. So a list is an ordered collection of elements. An element can be just about anything. And lists are mutable, which means they can be changed. So this is a list. I have a variable called my list. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal statement. On the right-hand side of that single equal statement is some new syntax. I have a left square bracket followed by a string Lisa, I know it's a string because it's in quotes, a comma, number 42, a comma, 3.14, and a closing right square bracket. What I see here is I see the assignment of a list with three elements to a variable named my list. So what is Python going to see? Python's going to see my list. And the value is, in fact, going to be three different elements. Now, this list, even though it has a string called Lisa, 
the number 42 and 3.14 still has indexes. So Lisa is at index 0, 42 is at index 1, and 3.14 is at index 2. So the basics of I have an index for every element in the list and the first index is 0 still holds true. So let us go and look at yes. Okay, could you balance that with a second close quote? I'm sorry, did I miss that? Which slide was that on, James? Was it on back on the air slides? Okay, so you're talking about these. Which one of these were you talking about? Uh, One, two, or three. Okay. Type that in the chat. I'll keep the chat open and look at it real quick um, while I continue to talk about lists. Um, actually, let me finish this slide and then I want to go to PyCharm. So this is what you see in your script. This is what Python sees. So we've got some new syntax going on here. And we need to talk a little bit about that syntax so we understand what it should look like. I have an open square brace. The open square brace tells Python, prepare, you're about, you're about to, to deal with a list. Then I have an element. That element could be a string a float, an integer, or a boolean. We don't really talk about booleans till next week, but it could be any of those. Then I have a comma. Comma separates element in, a li in lists. You have to have a comma to separate those elements. Then I have the number 42, another comma, the number 3.14. You will notice after 3.14, there is not a comma. You don't need a comma after the last element in the list. What you do need is the closing square bracket and it says um, that the, the list is, in, is done. So you have encapsulated those three elements into a list called my list. So let us open up PyCharm. So for those of you who weren't here last week, um, Actually, we'll come and do this in just a second. For those of you who weren't here last week, I use PyCharm all the time. And I suggest you get familiar with PyCharm for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is that this is how you're going to have to write your project. It's gonna, you're going to have to write it in PyCharm. Secondly, PyCharm has a lot of really cool, neat features that... Um, that really allow you to understand what's going on in the code um, that you wouldn't get from just looking at Zybooks. You can do the debugger, and I will use the debugger all the time. So since we've only done this part, I'm going to continue on with the slides, and then we'll go in and we'll look at some scripts. Okay, so last week I talked about CRUD. I'm going to talk about CRUD again this week. CRUD is Create, Read, Update, and Delete. And those are the four things you can do with a list in Python. I can create a list. I can make a new list. I can make a new empty list. I can make a new populated list. I can read it. I can get at the data within that list. Using, usually using the index, I can modify the elements within a list. I do not have to create a brand new list. I can just go in and change out an element. 
And I can delete a list. And delete means two things. I can remove something from the list, or I can remove an entire list. So create, read, update, delete. We are going to talk about CRUD a whole lot in this class because um, all of our collections deal with create, read, update, delete. So how do I create a list? Well, I can create an empty list, which is just the opening and closing square brackets. I have a variable name on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right-hand side, I simply have an opening and closing square bracket. I can create a populated list. We saw this on the last slide. I have a list. I have three elements in the list. Um, and so there's already data in the list. I can read. I can get at stuff in the list. So how do I get at stuff in the list? How do I print the first element of the list? How I do that is I use the variable name for the list. So I use the variable name my list, and I say I want to see the first element, and this is where it gets tricky, the first element in the list. Or I want to see the element at index 0, which is always going to be the first element in the list. Now, the um, syntax I use for that is the name of the variable, open square bracket, the index number itself, close square bracket. And what that will do is that will get me to Lisa. And if I had a 1 in there instead of a 0, it would get me to 42. So that's how I get at data in the list. That's how I access it. OK. I can also print my list of 2, which is just going to be the number 3.14. So the syntax is variable, open square bracket, the index number that you want, of the, of the value that you want, and a closed square bracket. That is how you get to information in a list. So we have update and we have delete. I can change a list in place. I can have Lisa, 42, 3.14. I have three elements in a list. But what if I want the second element in the list to be 25? I can simply change it. I can say my list, open square bracket, of 1, or the, the element is that I'm changing is the value associated with index number 1, close bracket, equal the new value, and in this case 25. So I have replaced 42 with 25. There's three, still three elements in the list. I've just replaced the value of one of those elements in a list. I can also add things to the end of a list. Uh, Python provides a whole host of functions associated with lists. And um, actually, we can go out and look real quick if anybody wants to a little bit later. Um, one of those things is an append function. Now, I'm going to use something called the dot notation here. So I say my list dot append, open parenthesis, quote, add, close parenthesis. My list is the variable because that's the variable that contains my list. Now, I've got this dot and then a, the word append. The dot tells Python that whatever function is coming to the right of the dot is supposed to, that functionality is supposed to act on the thing to the left of the dot. So, Python's going to say, OK, I have to append, so I have to add the word add someplace. Where am I going to add it? Well, I'm going to add it to my list. So my, that's what my list.append does. If I look at the append function, it says I got some functionality. What do I do that use that functionality against? I use it against the list stored in the my list variable. So that is dot notation, and we're going to see that all over the place for the next seven weeks. So when I use the append function, I add something to the end of my list. So now I have a list with four elements. I have Lisa, 25, 3.14, and 
the word add. Now I can delete. I can delete an element from a list. Maybe I don't want Lisa in there anymore. She's got to go. So I say del, D-E-L is a keyword in Python. It's reserved. And I'm going to say del list at index 0. And what Python's going to do is it's going to redraw that list. And I'm going to have three elements in the list instead of four. And that first element is just going to get erased. It's going to get wiped away. So then, and it will re-index them. So it will say, okay, my new index 0, the value at index 0 is now the value, the integer 25. The value at index 1 is 3.14, and the value at index 2 is add. So it's going to redraw that index when you remove an element from the list. And I can also use a function called remove. Let's say I don't know what the index value is, but I want to get rid of the word add from my list. So I can use the remove function again with that dot notation to get rid of the word add. So what I'm telling Python to do is I'm saying, hey Python, use the remove function to get rid of the word add and I want you to get rid of the word add from the variable my list. So it's my list dot remove, it's the dot notation again, will get rid of add and now there will be two things in that list, 25 and 3.14. And I can also use that same del keyword to remove the entire list. So I can just say del my list and the variable goes away. Anything associated with the variable goes away, that whole list is just wiped out of Python. So the del has kind of two meanings and if you ever use it you need to remember that. So let's go and look at a little pie charm. Okay. Okay. Um, is there a space after del? Yes. So after every keyword, you will have at minimum a single space. Um, nope, just del space my list. That's all it is. So no problem. If you have a keyword in Python, you are always going to have to have a space after that keyword. I don't think there's an except. I'm thinking there's an except in my head. But now I'm actually going through it and I'm not, I'm not getting that except. So we'll try and keep me honest. Hopefully it will uh, be okay. Hopefully I will have gotten that right. So let's go to PyCharm. So this is just a, a, a script called Simple List. Now all of these scripts, including one you see lab 2.12.py, will be up on the YouTube channel in the description there will be links to a Google Drive with the scripts. And I'll explain why lab2.12.py is there in a bit. So I have a list called my list right here. Well, let's run this first. First of all, if you weren't here last week, I like to use something called the debugger because the debugger gives me all kinds of insight into my code. One of the things I do with the debugger is I can set a breakpoint. A breakpoint is this little red dot, and I can get rid of it, and I can set it. So I've just chosen to set it to pieces length equal len my list. That len is a function you can do on a list, on any list. So let's, uh, what is this? I think this is simple list. Simple list. Is that it? Yeah. So I'm going to select the debugger. The debugger is this little thing up here. It looks like a bug. And what the debugger gives me is a couple of things. First of all, I have a console here, which you can have without the debugger. But I have this frames and values. Now, I don't use frames a lot, but I use values all the time. And what values does is it tells me the value of each and every variable that is in the scope of my function. Now we're going to talk a lot about scope next week, 
But for right now, everything's in the everything's in the same scope. So I I have stopped at line four. I could have stopped at line one, but I chose to stop at line four. I know I am stopped at a line of execution because this is blue. You'll see a blue line highlighting the line that you are on, which means the line has not yet been executed. And I can tell that when I look at my variables down here because I don't have a variable called prices underscore length. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because I haven't actually executed line four yet. Not until I step over that line will Python have done something. And what I'm doing here is I'm just talking, I, I'm telling Python, give me the length of my list. Len is a function, it's a standard function like a lot of functions are that are simply provided by Python. And LEN, open parentheses, a list, close parentheses, and in this case my list, will tell you how many elements are in that list. So if I step over line four, if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, under my list will pop prices underscore length equal, and then you'll see an int and a three. So PyCharm is telling me that the type of the value is an int, and the value itself is a three. So I have three things in my list. Now the other nice thing about PyCharm you'll see is you get these little gray things over here. These little gray things are just what is the value of this variable at this point in time. And you'll also see what I did is I just moused over it and left the mouse there. Again, that's another way to see what the value of that variable is at that point in time. Now you might be thinking, why in the world do I need to do that? I can look at it, you know, right now and tell. That's because when we start to get into branching and looping, it's going to be much harder to tell. So these are just little tricks that I find uh, useful. So I'm going to go back to the console and I'm going to step over line six and that is going to print length of my list is three. Now I want to get at some of the elements of my list. Now I'm just going to use the print function and I'm going to say my list at zero is going to be something. So in this case it's going to be Lisa. Now on line 9 and 10, I don't just use the, the value as it comes out of my list. Why don't I do that? Because I'm using the plus sign to concatenate strings, if I do that without the stir, without that stir function call, I'm going to get an exception because the second element is 42 and it's going to take 42 and it's going to try and add it to my list and you can't add an integer to a string and it's going to give me an error. So I now print out my list of 1 is 42, my list of 2 is 3.14. Now this is an intentional out of bounds exception. When you are using lists, it is kind of easy to go off the end of the list to just try and access something that's not there. This happens often because we start at index 0, not at index 1. So you'll say, okay, I have 16 elements in my list. All I have to do to get the last one is say my list of 16. It won't work. They won't work because there is no index value 16 because we start at 0. So if I step over, I get an error. That error said list index out of range. And what I've just done is I've said my list of sterlin my list plus one is sterlin. It just says get the, get the last element in the list. But what I didn't do is I didn't say minus one because the last element in the list is zero, but the length is three. So it's akin to me doing, let me just do this my list. Now that seems reasonable. Actually, let me just do it like this. Now this seems reasonable because 
right here I can see one, two, three. There are three elements in the list. But because there's only index 0, 1, and 2, when I try and do this, I'm actually trying to access a fourth element in the list that doesn't exist. So I'm just going to run this real quick. And you will see that, that I have, and I'll just show you how to read these, line 13 of this module. So let's go to line 13. Line 13 is here, and it says list index out of range. So this guy is the bad guy because there aren't four elements in the list. There are only three. Uh, let's see, do I want to do another one right now? I don't think so. Okay, so now why did we just talk about lists when we're here to really talk about strings? Well, because a string is a kind of a list, but it's a kind of list that can't be modified. That is what immutable means. Um, so you cannot modify a string in place. It just doesn't work. What you have to do is you have to use functions that Python provides that will copy and modify the string as it comes back to you, the, the result comes back to you from a function. And some of them look like functions and some of them don't quite look like functions. And CRUD applies, kind of. Create and read, apply. Delete. You can only ever delete the entire string. You can't delete a single element out of a string like you could from a list. And update. You're creating a new string with a modification. And that's what a lot of string processing is about. It is creating something new that's modified. So, create. I can create an empty string. Just two quotes. I can create a populated string. Quote letters, numbers, any kind of character in between, end quote. Now, I can get at the information in my string the same way I got at it from a list. This is where it looks like a list. My stir at index 0 is T. My stir at index 1 is H. And I can say my stir at index 10 is S. I can read just like I could from any other list. Now, I want to, but let's say I want to get a portion of a string. I don't want the whole string. I just want to, to get a little bit of it because I only want the characters starting at 10 and ending at 13 minus 1. I know. So this is called slicing, and that's what it does. It basically just takes a surgical cut out of your string and gives you a brand new string back with just what you asked for. Here's where it's a little tricky. Well, this part. I have a variable called myster. Right? Myster has this as a string in it. So from myster, I want to get the characters at 10, 11, and 12, but not 13. So I, my start index is always the letter that I, the first letter that I want. My end index is one past the index that I want. So if I wanted 10, 11, and 12, I have to say starting at 10 and ending at 1 minus 13. I have no explanation for this. In my mind, it would be much easier to go 10 colon 12. But for some reason, the end index is always the character you want plus 1, just the way it is. Now, there are also some... Um, Shortcuts, you can do 10 colon and then nothing after the colon and it will get you from 10 to the end. Um, it is important to remember that when you are string slicing, the product of that is going to be a new string. So the slice has to be on the right-hand side of a single equal sign, 
and the variable has to be on the left hand side for the single equal sign. So a little bit more about string slicing. I can have a shortcut. I want to start at 8 and go to the very end of the string. So I don't have to put that weird end plus 1 after the colon. I can also say get me the, the first four characters of the string. And I do this by saying open square bracket colon four close square bracket. So it just says get me zero, one, two, and three. Um, so those are shortcuts and they do make life a little easier rather than having to calculate the index. You can just say colon four, which is get me the first four characters or 8 colon is get me everything from the 8th character back. But again, string slicing creates a brand new string. So you have to have a variable on the left hand side as a place for that new string to be stored in PyCharm and Python. So there's a boatload of string methods. Python has so many. I can do some things with it. I can find a specific character and it what it will do is it will give me the index of um, the, the first instance of that character. In this case I'm asking for a lowercase s and how do I do this? Well I have a find function and I'm going to use the dot notation. So the find function takes a character or it could take a, actually it takes a string um, and I'm going to use the dot notation to say, hey Python, find me the first instance of the string, in this case it's just the letter S, on the variable myster. And it's going to give me back the index number. So it's going to always give, find always gives you back an integer. So what if I want to replace a portion of the string? Well, there's something called a replace function. If I want to replace this with that, so Python will go through and every instance of the string this, it will replace with the string that. Again, it's the dot notation. I have a function called replace. That function takes two arguments, this and that. And it's go it has to use the dot notation so I can tell it what string it's going to have to act on, what string it's going to have to create the new string from. from. And that is myster. So I'm going to create a, my, a new stir, which is a complete copy except the word this is replaced with the word that. So I can count the number of occurrences of a character in a string and you just might need this for a lab this week. I can say tell me how many times I occurs in the string myster. Well in this case it occurs three times. And that count function again uses the dot notation and it will always return an integer. Splitting and joining. You are going to split strings a lot in this class because we're going to take things in from input in a format and we're going to have to split them up into strings to do things with. So I have a string called myster. I know it's a variable on the left hand side of a single equal sign, the right hand side of a single equal sign, I have a string. I know it's a string because it's in between quotes with first, comma, space, second. And I want to turn this into a list. Not a list of the individual characters, but a list of two strings. How do I do that? Again, Python gives me a function called split. The purpose of the word split, the, the split function, is to take a string and split it up into a list. So the way we do this is with a, something called a delimiter. A delimiter is what we're using in the original string to separate what I want into the list. This could be a comma, could be a space, could be a colon, could be any character you want. So split takes as an argument that character. So in this case, the character that, that splits, that separates my the, the elements I want in a list 
is a comma. So what I'm saying is, Python, go out and turn the string Meister into a list, and each in I'm each new element, I'll, you'll know it's a new element because it comes after a comma. So I have first and I have second in my list by just telling it to split. Join does the opposite. I have two elements in my list and I want to join on I want to join them together into one string. So that's where I use the join. Now join won't work on Meister. Join will take as the argument to the function the list that you want to join and the the thing to the dot to the left of that dot with that dot notation for join is a string. And it could be a delimiter, it could be a space, it could be a colon, it could be whatever you want. And it will, that's how it will separate. So I don't have anything in between those quotes. And so my strings are all run together. So let's look at splitting. Uh, where is it? Simple split. Okay. Uh, pretty much that's all we did in the slide. Let me see something. What is the challenge associated with this? Um, I didn't put that down. And by the way, for those who are new to the class, you are not required to do the challenges. What's that? Nope. Nope. No. Oh, I already looked at that one. No, that's just printing. Okay. Well, we'll look at simple split real quick. Simple split. So all the simple split does is what just pretty much what that was doing. But that slide was doing with a little bit more. Come on, I'm trying to make this big and it's not cooperating. So I apologize. Nope. There we go. Okay, so all this is, it's just, we have that first and second, but then I do some more splitting down here, like with a social security number. So let's just run through this real quick. So I have a list. Lisa, oh, my bad, excuse me, simple split, uh, edit configuration, where am I, simple split, there we go, okay, let's debug this, I have two breakpoints here, um, three breakpoints, I have my first breakpoint, which just starts at the beginning, so, I've got Meister. I'm now going to split Meister. If we look at the variables down here, we will see that I have my list, and my list has first and second now, created from the list. So I'm going to join them together in my new stir, which is just first and second. And I'm going to join them with a comma. So now I have first, comma, second, just like when they came in. So I'm going to do the same thing with a social security number. I'm going to split it. I have my string. I'm going to split it with a dash. So now I have a list, parts, with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I'm going to create a separator called dash. And then I'm going to join them using my variable separator. Now here we're going into formatting. And we're going to talk about that in just a, a little bit, but I'll just, no, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Yeah, got to get moving. Sorry, sorry, I'm probably going to go over. So string formatting. There's lots of neat things you can do with a string. Um, and the format function helps that. What the format function does is it allows you to put placeholders in a string so that you can later on add 
something at replace that placeholder with something. This helps with code reusability. I use it all, all the time. It allows for parameterized string formatting. With Python 3 and above, there is a little bit not easier, but some people find it easier to read way to do it. I'm still much into the dot format world. But um, what also the dot format function does is it allows you to add format specifiers. So what I see here is I see a print statement. And the print statement says I'm, and then I have these squiggly brackets. The squiggly brackets in this instance, because in module six, so you're going to learn a different use for them, is just a placeholder. It says, hey, Python, expect that there's going to be a value put here. And so I go through that. And then I have another one that's open squiggly brace, colon dot 2f, close squiggly brace, and then another open and close. So I have a string, and that's all inside my string, all inside my quote. And then I have dot format. So there's that dot notation again. And I have this format function. And that format function takes a variable list of arguments. And that list of arguments has to be the same length as the number of squiggly braces that I have. So I have three squiggly braces, and that's a placeholder. And the second one's a placeholder with a format. And the third one's a placeholder. Whoops. My bad. Let's go back here. These are, it's all positional. So num1 will go into the first placeholder. Float1 will go into the second placeholder. And what that placeholder will do is it will make sure that for that float, it only prints out two decimal places after the dot. And f here, this colon says nothing, whatever's before the dot in the float, just do it. The dot says, okay, now anything after the decimal point in the float is going to be two. And by the way, that F says it has to be a float. So you couldn't put a string in this second argument and you couldn't put an integer. You have to put a float. And then the third one is just my stir. So let's actually go to simple format. Where am I? Let's go to simple format. OK, so here we have simple format. And what I have, let me stop this one and edit the configuration. OK, simple format. Where is it? OK. So I have a number called 32, 3.14159 for pi, and a meister is pi day. So let me start by debugging this. And if I go down here with variables, I see that I've already defined these because I stopped at line four. So Python had already executed lines one, two, and three. So when I step over this, it's going to output to the console, I'm 32 and it's 3.14 pi day. Pretty good. Now, I float and diff. OK, so I'm going to show you what a different format specifier will be. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to mess this up. and. Um, you can see the syntax here. So I'm going to define two more functions, and I'm going to say my float. So you'll see that this format specifier, the placeholder with a format specifier, did two places after the decimal. And this one with a dot three before the f in the format specifier did three. Um, three places after the decimal. However, I can mess this whole thing up. Right here, this I mean, it's not a syntax error. If this were a syntax error like that, PyCharm would give me red lines and red squigglies. There are no red lines and no red squigglies. 
So this is actually a logic error. And what I'm about to do is I'm going to run it, and it's going to die on line 7. Actually, I think I'll debug it, and it'll die on line 7. So I'm going to step over line 4, which is fine. Now I'm at line 7. So everything up to here has been fine. When I step over this, I am going to get a nasty big red thing. This is unknown format code F for object type stir. What in the world is this? all of this stuff telling me? First of all, don't worry about all this. Just don't worry about up till here, other than this line 7, because that gives you a general place to start looking, because that line isn't always right. But I have this, and it's saying, hey, F, you can't use F for a string. Well, what's going on? Well, like I said, this is in fact positional. So num goes to the first placeholder, stir goes to the second placeholder, and pi goes to the third placeholder. Now the problem here is stir is going to the second placeholder, which is dot 2f. And that f says, it has to be a float, and it's not a float. So that's why line 4 works and line 7 doesn't. If you look at these, this is num1, this is pi, which is a float, and this is meister. I've just swapped them here, and I caused all of this mess. So when you're doing your format specifiers, let's say in a lab this week, be careful of what you put in what position. How to determine what a float is. A float has a decimal place. So if we look right here, these are the three variable types that we use right now. We're going to add another variable type that we're going to use all the time next week. But what we introduced last week was integer, string, and float. A float is anything with a decimal place. If I have a number and a decimal place, it's a float. Now, if I had a decimal place here, whoops, decimal place, if I can find the right key, this would not be a float. And it would not be a float because, first of all, it has characters, and secondly, it's in a quote, set of quotes. Anything in quotes is automatically a string. So this is a float and it's because it has that decimal place. Okay, so I'm going to try not to keep you over too much. Sorry, guys. Uh, and we just went over this, so I'm not going to go over this here, but this is the string formatting example we just looked at. And what this shows you is that these have meaning from their position. So num1 goes to the first one, pi goes to the second, meister goes to the third. All right, so now let's start talking about the labs. In this class, I give you an answer once, and it's right now. Floats and integers are different. A float, an integer is a number. A float is a number with a decimal place. And what's the difference under the hood in Python, Carrie, is that a float can take up more space in the computer memory than an integer. Now, that's a whole lot of space, so we don't have to worry about it. But um, if you are dealing with pure with just mathematics, if you see, you know, a dollar fifty or one point five, that's really a float. Whereas a single dollar is just an integer. Um, I hope that helps. So, Lab two point one two, in my view, is not fair, and it's not fair because it requires that you use the if statement. And we don't learn about branching until next week. It mentions it for a small amount of time in Zybooks, but in my mind, not enough for people to get to have a fair chance of getting lab 2.12 correct. So to remedy that situation, 
Lab 2.12, the script for it, the answer, will be up on the YouTube channel. Uh, school knows I do it. Most of the professors that have been around t a long time know that I do it. Um, but it's just because we don't give you enough information to get Lab 2.12 done. Now, if you want to try and do it on your own, go for it. I applaud you. But don't spend hours being frustrated trying to figure out what it is that we're asking you to do here because next week is when we start teaching you how to do what they want you to do in Lab 2.12. So basically, what they're asking you to do is if somebody puts in three words, you're going to create a first name. If someone puts in two words, it's going to be first name, last name. If they put in three names, it's going to be last name, first initial, dot, middle initial. And that's where you need the if to do that. And we don't give you the if. So this is the flow chart for Lab 2.12. And basically, you're declaring a name. You're inputting last name, first name, and middle name. You're going to split it into a list. Um, and you're going to split the list using a space delimiter. And then you get this if statement. Now, this if statement is what we haven't done yet. If the length of the list is greater than two, then we print one format. If it's not, then we print another. So like I, I'm not going to really say much more about it. It's, it'll be up on the YouTube channel. Lab 2.13, I do not give you the answer for because we have everything we need to get it done. And um, you're going to input a string which contains a character and a phrase and whose output indicates the no and you're going to output the number of times the character appears in the phrase. So we had, I think it was count, that gave you the number of times a, uh, a character appeared. So we got a couple things we have to do here. We have to declare a string. We have to input the string. We have to declare a list, and then we have to use the split function to create a list from the input string. Now, this is not going to be a comma-separated list. It's going to be a space-delimited list. So you're going to have to look inside books to see how do I split a string based on its spaces, which will be in section 2.11. You're going to declare a variable, I just call it care count. And you're going to set care count to the character count. Now you're going to get that character count by using one of those dot notation functions from a string. So it will be whatever your string is, my stir. I'm sorry. Yeah, you will you will use the count function against your the second element in the list, wait a minute, yeah, the first element in the list will be the character. The second element in the list will be the string. You're going to use the count against, you, you're going to count the number of the times the first character that you input is in that string. I hope I didn't make that more difficult sounding than it really is, because it's not. We've Everything that you need for 2.13, we have gone over in this class. So 2.14 is you're going to have the user enter two words and a number, storing each in separate variables. That means you're going to have three input statements. And then you're going to output those on a single line separated by a space. That's pretty easy. We did the end equal last week in the print statement. So there's a print with a single the way to call print with a single argument and two arguments. It's the way you call it with two arguments that we care about. You're going to output two passwords using a combination of the user input. Format the passwords as shown below. So you're going to have the word underscore the second word. And that's one way to output it. And then you're going to output it the number concatenated with the first word, concatenated with a number. 
and they're going to output the length of each of the passwords. So my suggestion is you store that password in a variable so it's easier to get the length. And that's using the len function for the string. So here's a quick look into the um, flowchart for this. So we're going to declare two words and a number. We're going to input two words and a number. We're going to declare password 1 and declare password 2 because I think it's important that you store these passwords in variables. You're going to set the first password to num word 1 and the second password to word under word 1 underscore word 2. And then you're going to output password 1 and output password 2 and output the length of password 2 and output the length of password 1. Uh, actually, that might be, you might want to do password 1 and password 2. My bad. All of that, all of this section can be found, and, and half of this section can be found in section 2.7 of Zybooks. So, does anybody have oh, any questions? Anybody want to open it up and talk about any labs? Going once? Going twice? I've actually been banging my head against working my way through every chapter from page one to the end of it. Okay. And it's hard when you have two jobs. Uh, I can. I. I only had one job when I did my masters, so this can be very challenging for people that don't have two jobs. And so, the tutoring service has been a huge help. I'm glad. And Gary or Gray, I'm dyslexic too. I have dyslexia and dyscalculia. So let me help you. And Lucy, yes, this was listened. This was recorded. And there are also recordings out there from about three years worth of this class. I do have a, um, um, your slideshows. Are they accessible where we can print them off and use them as reference notes? No, I don't provide the slideshows. I only provide the videos up on YouTube. Um, I've had people take my work before. So That's dirty. Yeah, it's dirty. So. Oh, I hope you didn't mind. Yeah, I kind of did. So I don't provide the slideshows. Um, I thought about providing them in PDF form, but still it bothers me. So burn one. It's really, it's really frustrating when you do all the work to build the code to answer the questions in the Zybook, and you figure it out without having to use the tutor but then you've got to take time to write down or copy and paste to a Word document that problem and that code because when you go to print your notes that you've made or your code that you've made, before it renders the PDF, it wipes out all your answers. So Can you I don't... make a suggestion, James? Rather yes. than write it down, <clears throat> create, just, just copy it into PyCharm with the lab or the um, a participation activity number. Make it a .py file. You can add comments to it as well. Oh my gosh, that sounds so simple and I never thought about it and I That's downloaded okay. PyCharm before class ever started. So that, that would be my suggestion. If you want to keep your work and you want to keep notes about your work, copy it into PyCharm when you're happy with it, then type your notes and leave it as a .py file. Thank you. I'm going to start doing that. That's, I wish I would have thought of that. That's okay. That's why we kind of think about it like this. Okay. Problem. This from our activities. Tool will allow us for experimenting with print statements. Country population and country name have been defined and can be used in the simulator. Try printing the following output, the population of China in 2021. Okay, so what was the problem? You couldn't get the output to print. Is that right, Carrie? Okay, so can you share the statement that you were trying to use to get the output? Can you show me the print statement? 
even if you just copy and paste it in here. Cool. So Gray, where does the confusion start? So is it with the basic concepts of like variables? Did things start getting fuzzy? Um, okay. So declare. Okay. So declare usually in programming just means you're going to define something. That's okay. Everybody has to start somewhere. Okay. Give me just a second, sorry. Okay. So print population of country name was country population. Okay. So here's the problem. If this is your print statement, what you have just done is you have told you've told Python to print the words country underscore name and the words country underscore population, but you haven't told them to print the values. So this is just this is just letters when it's in inside the quotes. So what you have to do is you have to either do the format specifiers we talked about or you have to add them together. So it would be something like um, oops. My bad. So what I did, whoops, was put equal where I should have put plus. Okay. So What I did here was I separated the strings from the variables, Carrie. So I have a string inside the print parentheses for the print statement. I have a string, the population of. Now I put in a space between of and the, the close quote for that part of the string. So there will be a space in the string. Um, plus country underscore name plus was plus country underscore population, plus in. So what I've done is I've concatenated. What do you mean you don't? Oh, sorry. You're not now sharing your screen. My entry. <laughs> I had to hit the enter key. <laughs> so, okay, that's good. So James, you're a newbie, absolutely nothing about coding until this class. I have ADHD and get very easily distracted. <laughs> You've got this great. Yes. Everybody's got this. I learned, one of the reasons I teach is because I'm neurodivergent. And I think neurodivergent people make great programmers because we think differently. And I have enough hubris to believe that I can teach people the mechanics so that they can then think without worrying about the mechanics. So this class is a mechanics class. Okay. My problem is, is I'll run through, like I'll sit and I'll run through the multiple choice questions and I'll run through all that and then it's, so, it, it's almost, I guess, like test anxiety. As soon as I get to the practical problems where we've got to start building the code at the bottom of each section, mm -hmm. it's like my brain just goes, hey, and, and that I can't do anything. 
when when you're having to do the, those are the labs, right? Well, I do the challenge activities just to make sure that I have an understanding of what that section's about, and it just okay. never fails. Every time I get down there, I'm just like, eh, oh, well, what? Here's a suggestion. Um, I I have a freeze response in my brain too. So here's my suggestion. When it comes to the challenge activities, um, instead of thinking about writing code, because there are two parts of programming. There's the syntax, and then there's the thinking. There's a book called Think Like a Programmer, and it's actually written about Python. And it's really good because it separates the, the, the syntax from the thought process. And so my guess is, and my, my personal belief is, that what we do is, first of all, we're not taught how to read word problems in school. Um, the book title is Think Programmer. That's the name of the book. Um, the we're what was I saying? I'm sorry. So what we have to do is we have to break the problem down from the initial word problem into something that is a series of discrete tasks. And most people aren't used to doing that. I mean, I work with some people who it comes naturally to. That's just the way their brains work, and that's a beautiful thing. My brain hasn't always worked like that. I have to sit down and think about those discrete tasks. It's one of the reasons I've been putting up the flowcharts, because the flowcharts work through the problems as discrete tasks, each and every step. So in this case, by the way, great, declare just means define. It just means it's a variable. So and next week, I'm going to start using pseudocode. So the flowcharts in the pseudocode are language agnostic. They can be used for Java. They can be used for C and C++. They can be used for Python. So that's why you have like the word declare. But all that means is I have a variable. So if you're going back and let's like, where, where did I put one? Let's look at this one. We want to find out what the keys are to this before we go down the road of trying to write it. So there are a couple of keys here. First of all, it says prompt. Prompt means there's going to be an input statement, at least one. Okay? So you know that you have to input something. You're going to have to use that function. And then enter two words and a number, storing each in separate variables. So two words and a number is three. Storing each in separate variables means you're going to prompt the user three times. So there's going to be three input statements. So you already know that. And then it says output those three variables into a single line separated by a space. So I'm going to, I know I'm now going to have a print statement. That print statement has to print each of those variables that I stored from the input on a single line separated by a space. Oh, that's easy. I can either use a dot format specifier or I can do what I just did with carry right here. This is one, two, well those are three, but this is just two, but we would do something similar right here and that's the first portion of the problem solved. So break it down. Now I have to break down the next part. The break, the next part says output two passwords. Well, two passwords are just two strings. They're just calling them passwords because they wanted to call them passwords. They could have called them Fred. They could have called them boat names. It doesn't matter. What matters here is that I'm outputting. So that means I'm going to use the print statement twice on section two using a combination of the user input. Okay, format the passwords as shown below. So the first password is going to be 
the first word, then an underscore, then the second word. So I already know how to do that because I did number one. So it's just going to be the first variable plus an underscore plus the second variable in a print statement. And the, the next line is just number, password, number, word one, number. So I've got the second one, and I did that by breaking it down. I'm not trying to solve this whole thing. The best way to program is with baby steps. Don't think that you can come out. Well, I know a few people, one who has a PhD in physics, that can come out with a program in his head. It just looks at it and it's there. That's not the way my brain works. I gotta, I gotta think about the steps. So three is output, print statement again, the length of each password. So the length, how do I get, the, the password is just a string like we just said. How do I get the length of a string? Count is close but not quite there. L-E-N is the length of a string, Gray. Um, count is back in, in 2.13 where we want to get the number of times a letter um, just shows up in a string. So that's how you go about this. Oh, I don't. Did I stop? Okay, you don't have it up. Do I have it up now, Gray? Sorry if I was confusing. Um, so that's what you do. Okay, so that was 2.14 that we were talking about. If I go back to... That's 2.12, 2.13. So um, 2.13, the number of times a character appears in the phrase is going to be find. So where did I show find? Where did I show find? There's the format specifier stuff if you need it. Uh, count. I'm sorry. Okay. Count is for 2.13. Not find. Find is giving you the index. Sorry, it's after 10 o'clock. When, when it turns 10 o'clock, my brain turns to mushy gray matter. Count is what you're going to need to determine for 3.13. Sorry, 2.13. Yeah. So for 2.13, you're going to need to use this count function and this specifier. And if you need to see it, in um, a script, look at simple string. Oops, where is it? Simple string. Is it there? Yep, there it is right there, count. So this is how you use the count function. It'll be up, there'll be a link to it, to the Google Drive. All these are on, on a Google Drive and there's a link in the descriptions. Um, so that tells you the occurrence of a character. So those are two different functions. Len is for the total length of a string. I don't care about the characters. I care about the total length. So that is for 2.14. Yep, that's it. Think like a programmer. So for 2.13, you use count. For 2.14, you use len. Different functions have different purposes. So let's do this. Let's go to... Spell that right? Nope. 
documentation. So if I look at documentation, go to the Python docs. Python has full documentation for everything. Oh, by the way, Gray, just to let you know, have you ever heard of Open Dyslexic? It's a font. Okay, let me show it. I'm going to probably drive some people crazy here for a second. I should have had it turned on. I don't know why I turned it off. Uh, where is my Open Dyslexic? Open Dyslexic for Chrome. On. Okay. This is Open Dyslexic. Letters don't move when I read things in Open Dyslexic. This is so much easier on my eyes, and it also is supported on Kindle. So, anyway... Python has, isn't it? Isn't it so much easier to see? My letters don't blur out. It is just so much nicer. It's free. Here. Here. I'll copy this in there. Go for it. Anybody who needs it, it's so much easier to read, and I have it on my Kindle. It won't, they, do, they do support it for Android phones, but it, it is not supported for iPhones yet. So if you look in Python, you will see every single version that is currently supported has full documentation, including APIs and all that other stuff. So let's say I want to look for count. So there's got a whole bunch of counts here. Well, I'm going to do it on strings. So I'm going to do this and look at all of this stuff that Python has on string methods. And one of those things is the count function. So don't worry about that one. Don't worry about that one. Hold on type stir. So string methods. Here are my string methods. All of these are string methods. I have a count right here. Return the number of non-overlapping occurrences. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the only problem with these pages. Find returns the lowest index of the string where the substring and they have, they always have, um, sorry, they always have examples here. And another thing that you can do is, let me see, three, string count. W, W3Schools is a great resource, and it will give you examples. So if you say, okay, i got to count something on a string, how do I count it? Or I can do W... Three Python string length. And right here, it's going to tell you how you get the length of a string in Python and any related pages. Now, some teachers will probably go run screaming from the room when they realize that I've told you how to find answers on Google. But you know what? I look at Google all the time, and I'm a professional programmer. I do this for a living. Google is important. So don't hesitate to go out and ask questions to Google. Have I answered everyone's questions? And is there anything else I can help you guys with tonight? Because next week, things get harder. I like to have everybody's foundation set because next week, we're going to have it's going to start, uh, we're going to, um, okay. I'm sorry you're crying, Gray. I hope it's a good cry. Everybody have a good evening. I'm losing my voice and my brain went a half an hour ago. Um, if you're in my class, please reach out and um, let me know if you need any help, and I will talk to you later. Mm -hmm.